know a lot of you people out there uh, don't understand. But there is a need for the world to know about this because the church is hiding and the government's hiding. There is a lot of people that died in those places. When the Lord your God brings you into the land you are entering to possess and drives out before you many nations and you have defeated them, then you must destroy them totally. Make no treaty with them, and show them no mercy. Do not allow any of them to live. This is what you are to do to them. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, cut down their trees, and burn them in the fire. For you are a people, chosen by the Lord over all others on the face of the earth. Is on our side, we can commit any crime. We're, we're absolved individually from that crime by believing that we have a higher sanction. And that's the danger of religion in that it allows people to do that. It allows them to kill without a shred of conscience. in the sunlight. The Alberni Valley was draped in fog that first morning I arrived there in the spring of 1992. Jesus once said that when we welcome the stranger, we're actually welcoming him. But how could I have known that by opening my door to him and to so many others, I'd be closing the door to all that I knew? Nothing was clear to me at first. I felt like I was on the brink of something, like standing on a dock, waiting. What was clear was that I was heading for a job interview at St. Andrew's United Church in Port Alberni on Canada's west coast, where I hoped to become the minister. When I walked through the doors of that church, I knew there was a deeper purpose that had brought me there. And sure enough, I got the job. There were no native people in my church when I got there. You know, there was like 20 people in the pews on a Sunday, and they were all white. They were like retired loggers and millwrights, and, and about a third of the population was native, and there were no Indians in any of the white churches. There were no Indians working in the stores anywhere. You know, It was just a, a totally apartheid, to, and it still is. It's a very much an apartheid kind of community. And that's actually one of the things that got me interested, just a little anecdote. When I went up at the end of the first service, I went up to the chair of my board and I said, you know, Fred, it's kind of odd there aren't any Indians around, you know, like, where are they all? And he got really defensive and he said, well, they keep to themselves, we keep to ourselves, and everybody likes it that way. And so when I went out to the, I got called out to the local uh, Seychat Reserve uh, to actually to conduct a, a wedding a few weeks later. I asked a man uh, who I was marrying, Danny Gus his name was, he was a retired native fisherman and he had gone to the Alberni school. And I asked him kind of innocently why there were no native people in church and he finally said to me, they killed my best friend in the residential school, he's buried in the hill out back. And the church people all know it. They don't want us in their church. So it's kind of like right away, bang, it was in my face 
this reality, these two worlds living side by side, not just native and white, but um, kind of an official world, the official history, and then the unofficial buried history. But Danny Gus wasn't the only Indian who told me of murders in my church's residential school. In my first year as minister at St. Andrews, I spend most of my time just visiting people and getting to know them. That was my job. And my first job was really to open up my church to as many people as possible, including the native population. In doing that, as more and more people came into the church, I gave them a platform. They began to talk about crimes they witnessed in the Alberni Residential School, which was run by the United Church for over 50 years. And they described children being killed. They described uh, pedophile rings where children were being passed around between the Indian agent and the priest and other people like that. Yeah, I had an open pulpit policy, so after my sermon, people could get up and comment on it or share any of their own thoughts in that. And in the, in the name... What did the whites do? Well, the whites would get up, you know, occasionally a logger would get up and defend the logging and, and that kind of thing. And, you know, people had the chance to say whatever they wanted. And Native people in their tradition, when to, they have, like, speakers who are officially delegated to talk. And so when, to give an example, there was a man, Alfred Keetla, who got up and, and began praying in his own language in church, which was quite something. It was quite, quite beautiful when he did that. But then as speaker, he began to talk about other things and uh, other people who got up would then share stories of children being murdered in the Alberni Residential School. That was later confirmed um, by a woman called Harriet Nahani, who actually witnessed a murder of a little girl by the principal of the Alberni School in 1946. Well, this fellow who Harriet claims killed a little girl called Maisie Shaw, uh, his name was Alfred Caldwell, and his daughter was right in the congregation. She was part of the old guard of my church. Did you believe it? Well, when people who don't know one another keep telling the same story over and over again, even if you're skeptical, you have to accept the fact that, you know, it's a commonly told story. And when people began to go further and tell me things that I found later being validated in, in documents, then you can't deny it. You know, as a minister, you, lean, you learn to uh, detect bullshit pretty quickly in people. And you can tell in somebody's eyes when, they, when they're suffering, and it's incredibly painful for them to tell a story. They're not making this stuff up. My name's Harry Wilson. My name's Kenny Quittell. My name is Virginia Baptiste. I'm from the Osuyas Indian Band in Oliver, B.C. My name is uh, Harry Lucas. I'm actually 64 years old. My name is Zebeot from the house of Zebeot of Ajida. My name is Nankaiska. I come from the people of Haida Gwaii. My English name is Douglas Wilson. In academic circles, I'm known as Dr. Douglas Wilson. I went to Port Alberni Residential School, 1959 to 1970. I went to the residential school in Cranbrook, B.C. My first year was 1955. I went until 1963. I'm a survivor of the Edmonton Indian Residential School. I was there from... 1957 to 1961. At age five, I was kidnapped by terrorists in a gunboat. The RCMP had this gunboat. It was a, a RCMP boat with a gun mounted on it to gather children from villages. We were, we were segregated right from the day one. I remember in September we were all on the beach and we were all given numbers. When I first got to school in Cranbrook, we were all given a number. Uh, my number was 54 and my, my underwear, my socks, my uniform, my uh, towels, everything that I had had a number. It was 54 on there. and. All the girls had their own numbers. And if you were caught with a, somebody else's number, you got whipped for that. We weren't allowed to have books, and we weren't allowed to read. If we were caught reading any kind of a book or a magazine, you, uh, you, were, you were punished. There was a severe punishment that way. The kids who told on us got preferential treatment, whereas the children who sang their songs and spoke their language 
were punished constantly for every, any little thing, for even, even for laughing. It was always hard for us to tell one another we love you because we were taught to love was wrong. They told us to love was wrong, that was the devil's work. But yet these priests and nuns could hug and kiss. And we couldn't even hug our own brothers. We couldn't even hold them and tell them we loved them. It took me a lot of years before I was able to tell my boys I loved them. Three years it took me to realize it, though, you know, of torture and pain, you know, being strapped at a young. You know, I, I lost my childhood when I first got there and never knew what it was like to have parents. Still hurts. Sorry about that. Sorry, you don't apologize. But I never knew my mother, and still don't today. I couldn't remember any good times that were there uh -huh. because I was being um, punished for things I'd never done. Like what kind of punishment? Um, punishment by restraining me to the bed, by putting a restrainer on me and holding me down in the bed. Um, I had bed problems as wetting the bed and they would tie me in bed and put an electric underneath my sheet so that when I did wet, I would electrocute myself. Did they put you in a hospital? Yes, they did. Well, they uh, give me some drugs or something like that. What kind, what happened I to you? I don't know what kind of drug it was. What happened to you when they gave you the drugs? Hey, oh, they uh, put me in there like a padded room. Padded room, like, I was, I was strapped down. That was after you reported the girl? Yeah. Finding the girl's body? Yeah. I'd seen them burn hands of kids when they're three years old and five with a little spike in their hand and like that, like a shock thing. Electric shock yeah. device? Why did they shock the kids? Because the kids wouldn't listen to the Catholic priests. He used it on my brother's penis. He electrocuted his penis there till my brother passed out. And he was laughing, brother. My brother said he was laughing while he was doing it. You'd like to see him in pain, I guess. And then the police force, I, I was involved in a few investigations regarding the victims of the residential school where one particular individual had went home in the summer and learned how to speak his own language. And his dad had taught him how to carve. <clears throat> he went back to school. He, uh, he, uh, he continued doing this, speaking his own language and carving. And the teacher caught him and took his knife away and broke his carving up. And, and he took a pencil and he drove it right through his hand. And you, you still see the scar where he drove the pencil right through his, his hand. Then there was other times where they put us in a tub and then they had a bucket of snakes, you know, them black and yellow snakes. And they throw that in the tub while we're having a bath. And the snakes are, they can't stand that hot water. They try and crawl all over our bodies, trying to get away from that hot water. And they'd all just curl up because they die immediately. And that was some of the horrifying things that they'd done to us, to discipline us, to keep quiet. What had I got myself into? My whole world was being turned upside down. I had a young family to support. My children were still only infants. I couldn't put them at risk, which I would be if I let those stories be spoken from my pulpit. I didn't know what to believe or who to believe. I know I didn't want to believe these stories. Well, when you went home at night with your family, your wife and two daughters, did you talk about this? Did they talk? Was this supper material to talk about? No, I couldn't really share this around my kids or really my wife at the time. Um, you know, it, for one thing, it was told in confidence, and another thing was uh, it was a nightmare. I needed help. I turned to the people who I thought would understand and support me, my colleagues in the church. That was a mistake. 
From top to bottom, the church denied that any children had been harmed in the residential schools. Not only that, but church officials even threatened me to keep quiet about what I had been told. I was told to just stick to what they called being a good minister and tend to my flock. But that's what I thought I was doing by opening the doors of my church, even to Indians. And that's ultimately what the church found intolerable, that I was bringing that truth, you know, into the pews on Sunday and, and letting those people who had been silenced for so long, long speak. And I'm still trying to do that in the work I do. Well, didn't any of the church ministers sit down and sit with you and say, these are the rules and regulations, you're not to mess with the natives and this is what happens? They weren't that blatant, but it was a subtle, they were subtle warnings I got. Uh, there was a fellow, uh, Bill Howie, who was head of the, the church, he was kind of like the regional rep for the United Church on Vancouver Island. And he came over to me after my first Presbytery meeting, which is where all the ministers get together a few times every year. And, and I made a comment at that meeting about how it was odd to me that there were no native people in our churches and that and we should begin to look into the reason why. And Bill Howie came over and he sat down next to me and he, with this big flashy smile, he said, you know, you have a very promising career in the United Church and a young family to support. And if I were you, I'd be careful about comments and, t and looking too much into, into the native people. So did it's you, like- Did uh, you get it? No, I mean, to, to me, that seemed very odd he would say that. And I didn't think, you know, I was filled with illusions and I thought, well, this is the Church of Christ. I mean, we're not going to stab each other in the back. I mean, I was very ignorant of our own history. There's an establishment within the United Church in Port Alberni that um, set out to destroy Kevin Annett, and they, they set out by contacting those members, which I call the cliques in, in Port Alberni, um, bring them together and uh, discredit Kevin Annett at all costs. Because what they had to lose was the fear of, of, of course, financial retribution from the Aboriginal people, but also they didn't want to hear about uh, murders and they didn't want to hear about abuses that took place with the Aboriginal people because they felt that they'd have too much to lose. And let's face it, they would. Who would want to go to a church that, that abused Aboriginal kids, murdered Aboriginal kids? When these stories began to be told, you could see some of the older white people visibly wincing and getting very uptight. And I didn't know at the time what it was about. It, didn't, it wasn't until subsequently that I learned that there was literal skeletons in the closet. Of, of, the, of the United Church, and they certainly didn't want them to come out. Yeah, I remember uh, back in 1992 when Kevin first invited us, I got the impression from non-Aboriginal people that, uh, that attended the service that uh, this was all fine and dandy, but uh, this really made a lot of them feel uncomfortable, and I got that impression by talking to a lot of them. And um, in fact, one of the comments made by one of the churchgoers was that they couldn't understand why Kevin was reaching out to us, the Aboriginal people of the Alberni Valley. I understood why Kevin was doing it because there had been an alienation for a number of years, and uh, but I didn't know that the, the anti-Aboriginal congregation that existed there was so adamant that they didn't want anything to do with us. What kind of people didn't they like? Well, definitely not the poor. <laughs> you know that one was obvious right off. Oh, well, there is a lot of yeah. racial discrimination. Yeah, a lot of a lot of racial stuff. They didn't want natives in the church. And as Kevin developed uh, the food bank and developed um, a dialogue about the murders that took place in residential schools, I suddenly saw firsthand um, the attacks that started to come towards Kevin. It first started out as whispers, and I remember hearing from people in the Alberni Valley who, who used to go to the coffee shops that uh, Kevin Annett was opening up a can of worms he shouldn't be opening up, and how dare he? Which is why I was removed so quickly. I was just summarily fired from my, my job without any cause without any due process or anything. On January 23, 1995, after nearly three years as minister of St. Andrew's United Church, Kevin Annett was fired without cause or notice by two officials of the United Church, without the knowledge or consent of his congregation. Kevin was told by one of these officials, Art Anderson, that there were no charges against him and that he was not under discipline, but that nevertheless he had to submit to what Anderson called, quote, pastoral retraining, and psychiatric evaluation if he was to remain a United Church minister. Anderson provided no evidence to support these requirements. At the time of Kevin's firing, his church was filled to capacity on Sunday mornings and Kevin had just received a vote of approval for his work and ministry by 90 percent of his congregation. I had no idea that it would blow up in my life to the extent that it did. I was a total innocent walking into a minefield. You know, I thought, okay, the worst that could come out of this is they'll reprimand me and remove me and send me to another church. That's the worst that can happen. That's what I figured. 
Was this your own conclusion, or did you arrive that with your family? You just no. I just realized that, that that's how you deal with a minister who can't doesn't fit, as they say, with his congregation, which I know is bullshit because I fit with most people there. But I knew in the power politics of the church, it's always a minority who hold the power. And these people who were the old guard, who were connected with the people who had run the residential school, who were scared shitless of Indians, you know, I who had the guilty conscience, those were the ones who had the ear of the higher-ups in the church, and I knew they were going to remove me. But I thought that they would simply, you know... Um, do the whole re-education thing and say, well, you're going to go and retrain and, and then you can have another church. But I realized pretty quickly when all of this stuff started happening that they wanted me out. They didn't want me. It was kind of like, uh, you know, in the Matrix when they, uh, the plugs start flying out of Neo, right? Like the system looks at him and go, whoa, he's not going to fit. Flush. And they flush me. <laughs> uh, Kevin was a thorn in the side of the establishment. And one of the meetings that I was made aware of um, it came up, well, if you want to really get rid of Kevin Anna, then what you do is you attack his wife and children. And how you attack the wife and children is you put a lot of pressure on them and say that the longer Kevin Anna continues with exclosing these murders and continuing working with the Aboriginal people, the harder it's going to be for you to feel socially acceptable in the community. And you know your husband shouldn't be doing this. And if your husband continues to do this, there's going to be ramifications for you and your daughters. I didn't think that they were going to eventually, like, basically destroy my life, get rid of my livelihood and help break up my family, which they did. They, well, where did your family, did you, was your, did you did you talk this over with your family, whether that was church business, you didn't talk with her? Well, eventually, children? eventually when, uh, with my wife Anne, who, uh, my ex-wife now, uh, I began to share a lot of stuff with her, and she was getting really scared about all this stuff, but what happened was, after I was fired, they went to her, and they actually offered to pay for her divorce, and help her, if she provided them with information, and in fact, Subsequently, they gave her documents, which tried to make me look like I was mentally unstable, which she used in divorce court, and she got custody of her two young daughters as a result. So the fact that the church would do that would, would actually help in, in the divorce to get my kids taken away from me. The fact that they would spend a quarter of a million dollars to throw me out of the church, that was all telling me and other people a lot of stuff. That was telling me that there's a much bigger agenda here. They're, they're scared, and they want me out and silence by any means necessary. So you don't just do that to somebody who has, you know, offended the congregation or who isn't a good minister. You don't go to that extent unless there's some other thing you're trying to hide. And that was clearly about these murdered kids and the stolen land. I witnessed the death of Maisie Shaw. You have as much right to call yourselves Christians as the members of the Inquisition. Where is your apology? Where did you bury the children? But this is where we found those, uh, we seen those little skulls. You found them in here? We found them in here. There was coal, like coal. I see it. We weren't allowed to come here. Never at any point when I was pleading with them to stop what they were doing to my family and I, even on that level of just how it impacted me personally, there wasn't a shred of humanity in them. They were like... You were looking in their shades. eyes, nothing there. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. So you know what? When that happened to me, I realized up until then, you know, like any of us, it, it's somewhat abstract. People tell you stories and you keep wondering, well, how could they do this? When I saw what they were able to do to me, one of their own, when they turned and shredded my life mercilessly and allowed my six and two-year-old daughter to go through hell, I thought, if they could do that to me, imagine what they could do to a native child who wasn't a Christian, who was dark-skinned, who wasn't part of them. Of course they could kill them. So I watched, and she was standing at the top of the stairs, and he kicked her. She went rolling downstairs. She ended up, she was, she was uh, laying like this, her eyes were open, but she wasn't moving. She wasn't crying. So I see that all the time. Her name was Maggie. She was two years older than me. And she was murdered in there by a nun. She pushed out the window, second story up, and she died. But nothing was done about it. We weren't allowed to see a lawyer or nothing. 
They just covered this up. Jenny wouldn't cry out, and then all of a sudden, this blood just spurred all over the place, and on her, on her back, and a small part of her back here. <laughs> it opened up. It opened up wide. And the pump came. There was two young men ran away. They got as far as Jasper, and they froze to death on the highway. And <clears throat> I know the exact spot that they died. It's just like all of us have that history. We know what happened to people. When I allowed a forum for that in my church, lots of stories were told, including. Um, a, a whole hidden history of how the church had been selling off native land to its corporate benefactors, including Macmillan Blodell, a big logging company at the time. And there were all these little backroom deals going on with stolen native land. And I called the church on that and they th showed me the door. The whole process of your firing was farcical. The church knew there were 1,400 lawsuits coming down the pipe over the residential schools. I'm convinced that your removal was orchestrated from Toronto from the church head office. I think it's obvious to me that the national office removed you because they knew of the upcoming RCMP investigation and of the land deal after Marion Best got your letter. They were in for a rough fight and didn't want dissent from a Port Alberni pulpit. The sale and speculation of a house at First Nation land on Flores Island, lot 363 on Canada's west coast, by the United Church of Canada, BC provincial government, McMillan Blodell and two local businessmen was brought to light and challenged between 1992 and 1994. The two individuals primarily involved in making these disclosures, Hereditary Ahousat Chief Earl McKenna George and United Church Minister Reverend Kevin Annett, have now been expelled from the United Church over these same events. In October 1994 I had attended a Presbytery gathering. That's where the ministers all get together to talk over church matters. And at that Presbytery meeting the whole issue of how land was taken from the house its people was basically covered up and denied by the church. So I took issue with that and I wrote this letter. Subsequently, I was fired from my pulpit. The letter is dated October 17, 1994, and it's addressed to the members of Comox Nanaimo Presbytery. Dear members of Presbytery, I am writing this in the wake of the brief discussion at the Fall Presbytery gathering in Gold River concerning the issue of the house its land settlement. I am both deeply concerned about the response of Presbytery officials to this issue and the way in which this matter was dealt with at Presbytery. My perspective on this issue arises largely as a result of long and fruitful discussions with the Ahousets, including with several tribal elders. The issue seems to be one of violated trust on our part, rather than any legalistic or documentary problem, as Presbytery officials have suggested. In a nutshell, Native land was given to the Presbyterian and then the United Church solely for the education and spiritual upkeep of the Ahousets, in particular the young people. This land was subsequently sold by the Church to a private white individual. Simple justice and decency requires that our Church rectify our wrong by seeking the return of the said land to the Ahousets and by publicly admitting our mistake. This issue has been clouded over by our Presbytery. Some officials have claimed that the Ahousets have created roadblocks to meeting or cannot produce appropriate legal documentation to show ownership of the land by the Ahousets. Sadly, these are precisely the words and accusations that a colonial system has directed against indigenous peoples ever since we took away their land. The very fact that we are waiting for the Ahousets to prove their case to us or to meet with us on our terms reveals at best an insensitivity on the part of our church to God's call for justice towards those we have wronged. At worst, it indicates a perpetuation of the racist and oppressive relationship that has been our legacy regarding indigenous peoples. 
It is not too late to reverse this legacy or the wrong we committed in regards to the houses land issue. Indeed, it is imperative that we do so soon if we are concerned at all about our credibility and integrity in the eyes of both the Indigenous peoples here and the wider public. If we do not clearly and publicly admit our wrong on this matter and seek actively to return the land in question to the Ahousets people, I will find it difficult to associate myself with the United Church on this issue. I urge Presbytery officials to meet immediately with the Ahousets elders on their terms and come to a mutually agreed resolution to this matter that upholds our paper position of supporting native land claims. Anything short of this will expose a dangerous gap between our words and our actions. Yours in Christ, Reverend Kevin McNamee Annett. So the fact that I was fired for pointing out that the church was selling off native land to its corporate buddy, the big logging company, Macmillan Bloedel, the fact that I wrote about that and was turfed so quickly out of the church is proof right there that you know, the, 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 the Achilles heel here is the issue of the land, how was it gotten? When you look into the mechanics of how the land was taken, it's out and out murder, mass murder. That's, that's exactly what I feel, that there, there was genocide. Um, the control was taken over when our people started to die through the smallpox, and that was, uh, we believe, was deliberately spread in our community. Smallpox was one of the most communicable diseases in human history and was responsible for the deaths of untold millions of indigenous people around the world, even after a vaccine for this disease was discovered in England in the 18th century. In reality, smallpox was a chief weapon in the deliberate germ warfare waged by European powers against native peoples because of its brutal efficiency. Within 10 days of contracting the disease, the victim was dead. I'm a descendant of Samson Piel. Samson Piel was the original family that were here. And the, um, Samson and his brothers and his sisters were the last that left when they came back after fishing and working wherever. They got back, all the family were dead from the smallpox epidemic and they were floating all around the beach here and somewhere up in the, by the creek over there and they um, they had to bury them all. There's been a study of a, a general called Jeffrey Amherst and Amherst Nova Scotia is named after him. He was a, a British general who conducted germ warfare against the Mi'kmaq uh, Indians in Nova Scotia and in the 1740s he kept a journal of this and he was so brazen he didn't hesitate to record what he was doing in the journal again because they didn't figure they'd ever have to answer to anybody since they were the law and in it he describes how they would go into hospitals where their own people had been dying of smallpox and they took the blankets and he gave it to one of his uh, subordinates a major who then gave took it out among the Mi'kmaq and the other uh, uh, Indians who were alive with the French like the Huron and the Algonquin speaking Indians in the eastern part of Canada. They were targeted, in fact most of the Huron were exterminated by, by smallpox. So they were openly admitting that they were doing this and all up and down Vancouver Island you have you know stories of the same thing happening, although happening through the missionaries primarily because they were the first ones into the area. Harriet describes in her village a little place called Clouse near Port Renfrew on the west side of Vancouver Island. She says in the 1860s there was 3,400 people there. By the 1890s there were 44. So it had gone from over 3,000 people down to 40 some odd people. 98.5 percent of the population gone. And that was mostly from smallpox. And their people say that uh, missionaries and British sailors had been dropping off these blankets to them that were uh, laced with smallpox and that's how so many people died. You don't get that many people dying you know, kind of accidentally, somebody caught a cold one day. I mean, that isn't the way those things happen. It was germ warfare. Tuberculosis was another weapon in the arsenal of germ warfare used against native people in Canada. A fiercely communicable disease, spread quickly by air and contaminated food, tuberculosis was responsible for many of the deaths of children in Indian residential schools across Canada. According to government officials like Dr. Peter Bryce, Residential school staff deliberately and regularly exposed healthy Indian children to tuberculosis by forcing them to sleep and play alongside children dying of the disease and then denying them aid or treatment. 
It was this murderous practice that was responsible for an annual death rate in the residential schools of nearly 50 percent. We're in the same room with people who had TV on them. They didn't separate us. Then we were forced to play with them. The nuns made us play with those kids. We didn't want to get sick either, but they, they were forcing us to play with those kids. And also, they made some of them sleep with the other kids too. The interesting thing was at the University of British Columbia, where I began to study for a, a doctoral degree, I began to find these records from a, a report by a guy called Dr. Peter Bryce, who, he was head medical officer for Indian Affairs. And in 1907, he went on a tour of all the schools out here, like on the coast and in the prairies. And he found that, uh, he claims that over half the children were dying every year from tuberculosis. And specifically from a practice whereby healthy children were brought in and housed alongside children dying of tuberculosis. And then none of them were treated or helped in any way. They were left to die of this communicable disease. Why? Because they wanted to kill off at least half the children and want to cull the numbers down. And Dr. Bryce, who, I mean, this is not some flaming radical. He's an establishment doctor who's re reporting back to his boss, the Duncan Campbell Scott, who is head of Indian Affairs. And he said in his report, uh, the quote is, I believe that conditions are being deliberately created to spread infectious diseases. So he was clear, children were being deliberately murdered by a practice of contaminating them with TB. That practice were, was referred to consistently. It's, it's now even talked about in some of the mainstream academic books about the residential schools. So it's gradually been accepted, although it was reported on the front page of the Ottawa Citizen as far back as 1907. This is from... Um, schools aid white plague. This is a, a discussion of Dr. Bryce's report. It's from November 15th, 1907. About a hundred years ago, they said the average death in the residential schools in the West was 69 percent. So over two-thirds of the kids die after one year in these schools. That's talked about in the mainstream press, and yet today so many people are acting like, oh, we didn't know this. Well, I mean, it's been public knowledge for a century in Canada. There's about 50 percent of the kids that died of TB. And uh, one thing I can tell you, too, is that the chief over there now, her mother had 12 siblings. She was the last one that lived out of that school. She's seen 12 of her brothers and sisters go in there, plus herself, but she came out. She said then the other ones never made it home. The Indian residential school system in Canada was an extension and evolution of an older system of genocide that began as early as 1540 in eastern Canada and during the 1840s on the Pacific coast. Its foundational purpose was the deliberate and systematic eradication of all indigenous populations that would not leave their lands and resources, abolish their own cultures and languages, and become Christians. That purpose has never wavered but has assumed different forms and strategies over the centuries adapted to the times and regions in which it played out as European conquest moved westward across the continent. European Christianity and its colonial empires were the plague. Residential schools were a refinement of that contagion. By the time that residential schools were firmly established across Canada, around 1900, the plague itself had exterminated most Aboriginal people in a genocide whose details are still largely unrecorded and perhaps forgotten. Well, we can look at the evidence of genocide and not, we can look at it and yet our mind not register the fact that it's proof of what we're talking about. This book is used in the university curriculum about residential schools. It has been for almost 10 years. And here's a, uh, a picture of children with active tuberculosis sores. Uh, you see the bandages around their head. And the, the inscription says they have active like open tubercular sores, and they're sitting here alongside healthy children. That was the practice described by Dr. Peter Bryce when he said they were being deliberately exposed to diseases. They weren't being quarantined. When you have tuberculosis, you're quarantined. You don't sit with healthy children. This is proof. This is proof of intent to commit genocide, this picture right here. Yet it's in a mainstream text. People look at it, and still to this day they say, there's no proof that we're trying to kill Native people. Well, the proof is right there in that picture in that practice which was happening in every residential school across Canada and it was documented by their own people. How did the parents and the relatives allow this to happen? The neighbors, well, they did they do anything? Mm -mm. They weren't allowed to. One of the documents I found is a thing called the application for admission form and it's a document that every native parent had to sign or they'd go to jail and what it did was it actually surrendered 
it surrendered guardianship rights to the principal of the residential school. So what this did is you had to s sign away the guardianship power of your own child to the clergyman who ran the residential school. And at that point, that principal of that school then became the legal guardian of the kids. So that explains why these things could happen, uh, how it could happen, because they were the legal guardian. They could do whatever they wanted to these kids. I remember when I released this to the press in 1997, we were holding a press conference and two officials of the United Church snuck into my briefcase and stole these documents. We got that on film, actually. But they, they were very worried that this stuff was coming out and because it proved you know, that they were culpable and liable. And as a result, the, uh, in 1998, the uh, Supreme Court uh, Justice Hogarth here in BC ruled that the United Church and the government were equally liable 50-50 for what happened in the residential schools. I was angry at my mother for years till I met her. And then she told me she was forced to. It was in the Indian Act. The cops came there and they were going to take us or she'd go to jail, be fined, or all three. And that's in the Indian Act too, it is. It's in the Indian Act. The Indian Act of Canada is race-based legislation that legally separates indigenous people into a separate and inferior class of citizenship under the control of one man, the Federal Minister of Indian Affairs. The Indian Act allows Aboriginal people to be expelled from their homes on reserve lands, arbitrarily jailed, subjected to involuntary medical treatment, and denied the right to elect their own leaders. Under the Indian Act, Native people are legal wards of the Canadian state in perpetuity, having the same status as children or the mentally incompetent. This racist legislation has remained essentially unchanged since it was first enacted in 1876. Its philosophy and regulations were drafted under the guidance of the Roman Catholic and Anglican churches through the Bagot Commission created by the Vatican in 1845. The Government of Canada enacted the recommendations of this commission in 1857 when it passed the Gradual Civilization Act. This legislation forced Indigenous people to surrender their land and identity and denied them any future title to their land, which was now owned entirely by the Crown. That's what genocide is when you look at its definition. It's two steps. They, uh, the fellow who coined the term, Raphael Lemkin, uh, who helped draft the UN Convention on Genocide, he had a de simple definition of genocide. Phase one is you eliminate the original pattern of a particular targeted group. You wipe out their language, their culture, you take them off their land. And the second phase is imposing the pattern of the domineering group on them. And that's exactly what happened in Canada, like in any colonized area, but it happened primarily through the churches here. This is the grave of Harry Gallaud, and for me, he's the epitome of the problem. You notice his grave has been desecrated. He was an Anglican missionary. He worked for the government as well as the Indian agent, and he also worked for the local timber company. He was like church, state, and company all rolled into one, and he was the man who brought in the local residential schools who who made sure that the children were all imprisoned in the school. He is single-handedly responsible for a lot of the misery around here in the native world. So I'm not surprised that somebody desecrated the grave. This cross is a symbol of all the suffering these people have gone through. Before you entered the ministry, you uh, did not buy in what the church was doing. What did you think the church was doing? Back then? Yes. Before you entered the ministry. Well, I knew that it was mostly talk. I mean, even as a kid sitting there in the United Church, I knew that y you could just tell things. Kids, kids are very intuitive, right? And they, they knew that these people aren't living what they're claiming. I mean, they're not loving one another. Is anyone coming over to our, our house when we're, we're struggling? My dad doesn't have his job anymore. We had to move down to a hotel in, in the downtown part of Vancouver. Were any of the church people coming over and helping us? No, not even the minister. You know, we were the pariah family all of a sudden. So I knew it was bullshit, but it, that didn't take away from what I felt in here was the message of Jesus, which to me was revolutionary. It wasn't so just, where did it go wrong, Kevin? Well, you cut me off there. Wait. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> it, it wasn't just that Jesus was a nice guy, right? You know, the benign, kind of loving man. It was, it was, yeah, like the hippie, right? It, that's never how I saw him. I saw him as a revolutionary. He got murdered 
because he was challenging the powers on behalf of the people who didn't have any voice, on behalf of, you know, the outcasts. I mean, the woman who was going to get stoned to death, or the people who are on the outside all the time, you know, the guys who get shit on all the time, they finally had a champion. And he said, not only am I your champion, but God is too. God loves you more than the asshole is doing that to you. And that's a revolutionary thing to do. And it was beautiful. I mean, it was like, it was like to me a new world. And I saw the church perverting that message. I saw them taking the side of the wealthy and the powerful. And they do this all over the world. They crucify Christ again and again, just like they're crucifying the poor. And I said, that's got to stop. I mean, that lie has got to stop. Well, it's like the early Roman Empire. They realized, look, we're not defeating these people. The more people we burn in the Colosseum and, and throw into the lions, the more people are being converted. They have a moral power here that's growing in the world. The, our soldiers are becoming Christians and are saying we don't want to fight anymore. You know, the whole empire was unraveling. So they were smart. They said, you can't destroy a movement like this. You can co-opt and pervert it. And that's exactly what they did. They opened the door. They said, come on in and sit down, guys. Take a seat in the empire. We'll turn you into something successful. You know, we'll give you power so you can convert people. We will give you the means to conquer in this world. You don't have to be persecuted anymore. And they accepted it. They turned their back on Christ. They shut the door on him. And they became the church. They became Christendom. And they got blood all over their hands as a result. But he's still outside the door there. And I was trying to open the door. When a lot of the stories began to hit the, the press about, you know, when the lawsuits began against the churches and the government of being brought by residential school survivors. At that point, they, the church decided to, quote, delist me, which was to actually throw me right out altogether. The person who had arranged the hearing, he was the executive secretary of the church mm -hmm. out here, Brian Thorpe. Mm -hmm. And um, he had arranged the hearing, chosen the panel members. The hearing was in the room of the church of a friend of his. And in addition to that, he was one of the four testifying against Kevin. I mean, here we're judge and jury and the whole thing gets blurred. I thought, wait a minute, what's this going on here? This is natural justice, isn't it? And this was natural justice. But this whole business of them, they knew I was taking notes on all the things that proved there was nothing going on according to natural justice. They saw me writing it down each time. Did they know who you were at the time? Did no, they, they know didn't. That they know, did they know your background, or did they just think you were some busybody woman? Oh, they the just back? thought I was a little old lady with very little to do. But after the first week there, I realized this was Canadian history, United Church history, and Native history. And deserves to be told. And I made a point of trying to be there all, what was it, 36 days of the hearing that went over six months? It was the first public and only public delisting of a minister in United Church history. It was really like a show trial, uh, to make an example of me. But at that um, trial, the, minister, the lawyer for the United Church, a fellow called Ian Benson, he said, the reason these uh, Reverend Annette is being recommended for delisting is not because of anything he did while in the ministry, but because of comments he's recently made to the press about the deaths of children in Indian residential schools. So they were very clear. They wanted to get rid of me because I was continuing to talk about these these deaths and murders. So in the period after I was fired from my job in Port Alberni, my wife and family and I had to move back to Vancouver where I could seek out retraining of some kind. I enrolled at the University of British Columbia. And basically at that point the attitude of the church was to put me on ice and try to ignore me. And it wasn't until February 1996 that they re suddenly revived their demand that I be expelled from the church altogether. And interestingly enough, they did that two days after it was publicly announced that the first lawsuits would begin against the United Church and the federal government brought by survivors of the Alberni Residential School. A lot of these plaintiffs that were suing the United Church had been in my congregation. I had been working with them, providing them information. Obviously, the church wanted at that point to just expel me from the church altogether. The purpose of the hearing was a total railroading and a processing to get somebody who had far too much information for his own good out of there. He'd stepped on big toes. He'd stepped on money toes. And the, the, the whole thing was to get Kevin Annett out of there. So sure enough, that same year in 1996, the United Church decides to go ahead and defrock me as a minister. I think the antiseptic term they used was delist. And in so doing, they spent over a quarter of a million dollars tossing me out of the church. Something I found pretty repugnant because that previous year, the church had told me that they couldn't come up with about $1,000 a month to feed the over 300 hungry families they were providing food for through a Lowe's and Fishes food bank in Port Alberni. And yet here's suddenly a quarter of a million dollars to get rid of one whistleblower. Also, the 
two men who had originally arranged my firing from Port Alberni, John Jessam and the lawyer for the United Church, and Brian Thorpe, the chief executive officer in BC for the church. These are the two guys who are not only responsible for my appeal, but for setting up the panel that's going to decide whether I'm going to remain a minister or not. So the whole thing from start to finish was a complete travesty of justice. It was terrible. At moments, I, I really wondered if I were in Guatemala or Mexico, rather than this quiet, late summer afternoon in this church in downtown Vancouver. I couldn't believe the things I was hearing. Um, it, it, the whole thing, I mean, I, I just remember, for example, that Kevin Annett had a great number of unsolicited letters of commendation for his work and his ministry. And he had always made his ministry a tough ministry, uh, a challenging ministry. And I think that you know, all these letters had come in, and uh, not one of them was allowed to be read. I believe Mr. Jessamine said, people here can read for themselves, these letters don't need to be read. But isn't it interesting that at the end of that hearing, Mr. Jessamine didn't have the same philosophy at all? Because when they solicited letters against Kevin Annett, and we know this from a person who phoned in from Manitoba, um, when they solicited these letters, all of those were read and put on the record. You know, for centuries, people have had three basic rights under common law. Those are, the first is the right to no charges being brought against you, the second, the right to face your accusers, and the third, the right to a trial before your own peers. Now, all three of those rights, called natural law, were totally denied me by that proceeding that threw me out of the United Church altogether as a minister. To give you an example of that, I was never told what the charges were against me. They repeatedly said, there are no charges against you. I asked to face my accusers. I said, who are the people who brought these concerns to you about my ministry? They refused to tell me who they were. And finally, when I'm appearing before that delisting panel, they weren't in any way my peers. They weren't people who I knew. They were three hand-picked individuals who were actually friends and associates of one of the men who had me fired, Brian Thorpe. I feel it is it will remain a very black mark against the United Church of Canada. It was a very disgusting type of, of procedure. I would call it a witch hunt. It was a question in my mind as to why a church would be carrying out such an activity. Why they would be spending the money. I mean, there, there are many aspects to this. I think probably the important one is an attempt to simply um, break down a personality and why they should be wanting to do this. Reverend Annett was someone who had the trust of the natives, of those underprivileged. And it seemed to me that the church should have been making use of him. Finally, one of the, the most absurd things is, right at the very beginning of the proceedings, we said, we asked the panel, what are the grounds for defrocking a minister in the United Church? We have to know that in order to mount in some kind of defense to show that, in fact, I am a credible minister. Molly Williams, who was head of the panel, said in front of all of us, she said, there are no grounds for delisting a minister. We will decide what those grounds are at the end of the hearing. So by doing that, there was no way I could mount a defense because I didn't even know what the terms of the whole hearing were. I mainly took down notes of things where events in that hearing did not conform to the laws of natural justice. In the first place, there was no charge. There never was a charge through the whole hearing. Now, the church people have lied about it since and said there was a charge. There absolutely wasn't. If they want to look at the church records, there was no charge. They kept saying there is no charge. We only want to see if Reverend Annett is um, suitable for ministry or not. It, the charges never even got made up. The first I saw of them was late March with a letter that came out in the Courier where suddenly I saw charges listed against Kevin Annett. I mean, this is the kind of nonsense that went on, but very dangerous and very hurtful nonsense. The people who I counted on as who would stand by me, they all ran for the hills. I mean, people in the churches, it was kind of like I call it the leper complex. They know to stay give you a wide berth because if they get close to you it might happen to them too so they I was pretty much ostracized and I you know speaking of South African apartheid it's like being a banned person you know in in South Africa you were when you were banned no, you couldn't meet with more than two people you, your name couldn't be mentioned in the press etc that's basically the situation I'm in the media won't cover my stuff there's all this story out there about how 
Kevin Abbott is crazy and trying to bring down the church and blah, blah, blah. And that's so that we, the people in the wider society never have to look at what I'm talking about, look at the evidence, because it's a way of keeping that evidence delegitimated. And it's it works. I can't believe what went on there, and uh, you know I, I think that Jack Bell said it all. He just couldn't stand to watch it. It was obvious that you had stepped on some pretty big toes, and that you were going to be slaughtered for it. On March seventh, nineteen ninety-seven, Kevin Annett was permanently expelled from United Church Ministry, despite the failure of church officials to offer any evidence that he was unsuitable for that calling. His expulsion was final and could not be appealed. The same day, Kevin was issued a legal writ by church lawyers that tried to prevent him from speaking about his delisting trial or any issue involving native people and stolen indigenous land. Kevin ignored this gag order and continued to speak out publicly about his firing without cause and expulsion without due process from the church responsible for the deaths of so many innocent children. Historically, it was interesting how everything was coinciding because as I got thrown out of the church, um, the first lawsuits were being brought against the church and the government by the survivors of residential schools. This would have been in early 1996. And right at the same time, kind of like the attitude was, well, you know, you got tossed out of the church. You must have done something right, kind of from the, from the point of view of Native people. And they began to, you know, my, the trust level went way up because I wasn't part of that institution anymore. And I was being invited down to these healing circles in the downtown east side of Vancouver to listen to people's stories. And then eventually they began to ask me to record them for them. And that's when I began to seriously document a lot of these stories that went... Up until that point you had not documented anything that was said at well, the Well, I hadn't systematically gone about it. I had you know, written down notes and that, that people had shared with me. But it was clear from the things they were sharing that this went far beyond the physical and sexual abuses that are talked about in the in the press. Well, they're not talked much anymore about, but for a while they were. The you know people were describing children being sterilized, uh, being murdered, being used in medical experiments, being deliberately exposed to tuberculosis and then left to die. They realized, and I realized with them that all we were doing is sitting around hearing everybody's sad stories, and it wasn't going anywhere. Uh, the people were not recovering from this. There were a lot of lawyers and native politicians making money off their pain. But they weren't changing anything in their life. I'd know people who'd tell their story and then go kill themselves. Well, was there um, a design to kill people, or was there just a design to no. have people talk? Healing is a, is a word from the dominant society. It's a way for people to make money off other people. People don't heal from this. That's the reality. The first thing to realize is that I'm never going to get over this, because it's not only so traumatic, but it's so systematic in the culture. You can't heal as a Native person. The whole society is arranged against you. What you can do is to tell the truth. And I realized that about myself. I was never going to recover from this. I'm never going to be allowed into the academic world. I'm not going to be allowed to have a job anywhere in, in Canada. And they actually threatened me with that. There was a guy called Art Anderson who was personnel officer for the United Church who had removed me. He had come in the day and handed me the letter that fired me. And he told uh, Bruce Gunn, my friend, the United Church uh, clergyman up in a house, he said six months after I was fired, he met him at a conference and he said, Bruce, if you have any pull with Kevin, you better tell him that he'll never work in this province again unless he plays ball. And sure enough, you know, that was an idle, an idle threat. They blocked my PhD at UBC. Every time I went to apply for work, they had been spoken to, you know, the prospective employer. That happened a few times. There was a systematic campaign. So I knew that, like with the Native people, I was never going to get over this. But what I could do, just like them, I could tell the truth. And that was our power, just telling the truth. And... That's what we began to do. Okay, we've got to do more than just talk about our pain. We've got to ask the bigger question, why did it happen and who did it? And why did they do it, right? So we said the way to do this is to hold a big inquiry. And we started inviting uh, Aboriginal groups from around the world and this United Nations group, IRAM, uh, to come in. And that's what happened in the summer of 1998 in Vancouver. I organized a lot of the survivors to come and give testimony at this. And at that tribunal, um, Anything you could ever imagine that went on in a Nazi death camp was described. There was a group of people from the Cooper Island Catholic School who described being um, part of a medical experiment in 1939 when German-speaking doctors were injecting them in their chests with these chemicals that was killing them. I'm 100% sure that we're used as guinea pigs in these local hospitals for some unknown reason. 
They were, were lugged off the hospital, I can remember that. And I know it wasn't for dentistry, I know I wasn't sick. I read Kevin Annette's document starting about six months ago, and it helped me understand how come my memory <clears throat> wasn't was so vague. In reading parts of it, they talked about shock treatment. In my last year there, the spring of the of 1961, I was taken from the school to Charles Campbell Indian Hospital, and from Charles Campbell Indian Hospital to Panoka Mental Institute. <clears throat> I don't know if I was there a week or two weeks, but I have vague memories of it, but the, the memory that flashed back for me is laying on this table and stuff in my head, and then these flashing lights just continually. They had put needles in my head and had hooked them up electrically and would zap me. At that time, my arms were put in a chair and locked in so I couldn't move. And my head was put on a, a brace in the back so I could not, I was like this, I couldn't move. And um, I can't tell you how long they had done it. All I remember is that I still... To this day, I still get a, you know, like my brain will still have that kind of a kick from it, right? Right. And um, they had done a lot of, a lot of bad things by um, putting medications in the food while I was in the dark room, bringing the food in, and you had to eat it, and if you didn't eat it, then if you threw it up into a bag, they put it on the plate again and make you eat it. I also went to the tribunal that was held, and although I've been with Amnesty since 1961, I had to walk out of that tribunal as the sobbing went on around me, and the gulping for air, and the crying of the natives as they told their stories. And I couldn't imagine, you know, Canadian men, policemen, fathers and grandfathers, going in and taking children out of the arms of native parents and putting them on a gunboat and taking them to these schools like Port Alberni. That all came out at that tribunal. I thought, my goodness, how could they take little five and six-year-olds? And as a grandparent myself with a little five-year-old, how dependent he is on family. How could they take those children to these schools where at best they were treated with indifference? But as we know, so much worse well, went on there. We've had Chief Harry Nice, we've had Chief Joe Gosnell, we've had Chief uh, yeah. Ernie Cray sitting in this room with tears in their eyes describing it to me themselves on television. Mm -hmm. I mean, it happened. We know it happened. And it happened in our lifetime, right? That's it's right. Not, it's not 150 years ago. Is there proof, though? Like Nazis... Scars. And, they show me the scars. And they also... They anything wrote, written down? Any doctors write down that they uh, went to? I did find documents in the Indian Affairs Archives describing these uh, doctors and how what was interesting was the, the order that was running the school, a Catholic order called the Montfords, as soon as they, some children escaped from these experiments, they went to the local, uh, their families. The, the local police refused to return the children to the school because of these horror stories they were hearing. The next day, all the Montford brothers resigned. They were just taken right out of there. And uh, the Oblates come in to replace them. So there was something very odd going on. And a number of the children died, and I found the death records and everything. So there, you know, there, there was that kind of stuff going on. Well, they, did the tribunal ask for proof, written proof? Or did they accept the oral uh, proof? Well, they had both. They had the oral proof, and they also had the, the corroborating, some corroborating proof that this stuff was going on. They also subpoenaed the government and the churches and the RCMP to come and answer questions, because ultimately they're the ones with the evidence, the, you know, the documentation of this. And every single one of them, from Jean Chrétien right on down, they just refused to come. They never answered or anything. But... Um, I mean, other things were described, the sterilization hospitals. Women showed up who described being sterilized simply because they were Indians and wouldn't go to church. I couldn't have any more children after Dr. Darby got to me. He made an announcement in our village that anyone who wasn't in church on Sunday had to report to him for a special procedure. I never went to his United Church since they did so much harm. But Darby was missionary so his word was law. So the Mounties came and got me and brought me to Darby. He gave me a shot. Next thing I knew, I was in bed, all bruised and hurting. 
I was missing all my gold teeth. Something didn't feel right inside me. I never could conceive after that. Later, another doctor told me I'd been sterilized. George Darby, he did that to hundreds of our women. As part of the eugenics movement that swept the world after the 1920s, laws to allow the sterilization of Aboriginal men, women, and children were passed across Canada under pressure from both Catholic and Protestant churches in Alberta in 1928 and in British Columbia in 1933. Missionary doctors of the Anglican, Catholic, and United Church of Canada sterilized thousands of Native people in hospitals all over Canada as part of the campaign to depopulate Aboriginal land to allow its occupation by European settlers and corporations. The main targets of the sterilization program were the traditional leaders of the Aboriginal nations, the tribal chieftains and their families, who were slated for extermination. Accordingly, the sterilization campaign against traditional families has continued to the present day. Dr. James Goodbrand sterilized many of our women. In 1952, when he heard I was going to marry a traditional chief, Goodbrand kept saying to me, if you marry Freddie, I'll have to do an operation on you. That scared me, and I tried to see another doctor, but the Indian agent wouldn't let me. So when I gave birth to my daughter, it was Goodbrand who delivered her. After the birth, I hurt really bad, and I kept bleeding. Then I learned that my tubes had been tied. He must have done it to me after the delivery when I was still unconscious. I heard Good Brand say he was getting paid $300 by the government for every, every Indian woman he sterilized. Are there any white people that gave testimony as to this happening? There was a couple of staff members from the Alberta School who gave testimony, uh, Caucasian staff members. And they, they confirmed everything and more than what the, what the people were saying. So how was the, what was the results? What did the tribunal do? Well... The result of the tribunal was they sent a report to the United Nations to uh, Mary Robinson was head, uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights in, in Geneva at the, uh, the UN office there. And they sent a report to her. I sent 14 hours of videotape plus all of the documentation and, and affidavits and everything to her office. We never heard a thing. Never got back to us. And a couple of years later, I learned that it was because of pressure that Canada brought to bear at the UN to keep this issue under the, under the wraps, basically. That's how, how could Canada do that? You mean Canada can influence the United Nations? Well, it has a lot of pull. For example, the, uh, at the time, the General Secretary's assistant was a woman, Denise Frechette, who was a career civil servant from the Department of National Defense in Ottawa. And she was the one at the UN setting the agenda of all these different you know, uh, divisions and committees at the UN. So it would, it would have been easy for her and others to keep this off the agenda. As an arm of the Canadian government, the United Church of Canada has led this attack against Kevin Annett and his work with the active support of covert operatives of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Cooperation between the RCMP and United Church in this silencing campaign against Kevin Annett began as early as June 4, 1996, when church official John Siebert wrote to Sergeant Paul Wilms of the RCMP's E Division in Vancouver to share confidential information about Kevin, after he had spoken out in the media about the deaths of children in United Church Indian residential schools. That same month, Sergeant Wilms used this information to confront and threaten Kevin if he did not stop making public allegations of murders in residential schools. When Kevin refused to stop investigating residential school crimes, this joint harassment campaign against him by the United Church and the RCMP intensified. Between 1997 and 1998, church officials sabotaged Kevin's doctoral program of studies at the University of British Columbia by blocking funding for him, which forced Kevin to withdraw from the program. One of Kevin's professors admits having been spoken to by RCMP officers about what they called the dangerous nature of Kevin's research into United Church residential schools. Yet by far the most serious attacks on Kevin Annett and his supporters came in the wake of the historic tribunal into residential schools that Kevin organized in June of 1998 in Vancouver. 
His success in bringing United Nations observers to this event to hear residential school survivors' testimonies caused the government to directly subvert and destroy Kevin's work. Naturally, it was sabotaged. And when you get big enough, it's kind of like being uh, a germ in a system. You know, you get big enough and the antibodies attack you, and that's what happened. Um, it was clear from the tribunal that a lot of crimes that had never been heard about were finally out there publicly, you know. People talked about sterilizations for the first time. The medical experiments that they were doing on kids at the Catholic and United Church hospitals and the residential schools on the West Coast, that was all talked about. We sent it off to the United Nations, and in retaliation, um, a lot of shit came down on the people who did it. I mean, um, Harry Nahani, who was the person who identified, you know, that the little girl had been killed, murdered at the residential school, the United Church, when she was a witness to it, the RCMP broke into her house without a warrant two weeks after the tribunal. The RCMP tactical squad ransacked the house at gunpoint, held everybody at gunpoint and just ransacked the house. Um, people were threatened. They were thrown out of their jobs uh, on the reserve after they'd given testimonies. Uh, the, I started getting followed around by these two guys who physically attacked me on two occasions. This was all within a month or two of the tribunal, so the heat began to come down. And I knew it was because things that were shared at the tribunal weren't just about the past. They were about pedophile rings that were being operated today uh, with the help of native politicians and church lawyers. It was about crimes of the present that were begun in the past but carried on today in the Aboriginal world. It all began to the veil began to lift for me. I realized I've got a real tiger by the tail here. It isn't just about, you know, something that happened years ago. Because if it was, why would the harassment continue? I mean, the stuff in the past has been resolved. They've bought off the witnesses. They've paid off people with court settlements. So why did they continue that? They continued the harassment because? because this is about stuff today. This is about how Native people are still being exploited, how Native children are still being used, uh, how land is still being stolen by multinational corporations and how the native politicians are important to this whole thing. And so they don't want the truth of the residential schools brought up because they themselves are implicated in these crimes when they were kids. They were the enforcers. They were the ones who helped abuse and, and control their fellow students. So they don't want that coming out. And I began to learn that after the tribunal. And the, like I say, the proof was in the pudding. We, we were shut down. The results of the tribunal were never acted on by the UN. The media imposed a blackout on the whole issue. I was completely isolated. In the year after the tribunal, it felt like a wall was falling down around me. This but cage, was it? Yes, the, these cage doors were just closing on me. Bang, bang, bang. The media wouldn't talk to me anymore. Let, my letters weren't printed. People started uh, talking to me. The native chiefs wouldn't have anything to do with me. Uh, it was just absolute shutdown on every front. So, why did you continue? Well, I, I didn't really want to at first. It felt like this is pointless. I'm up against the state. I'm up against, you know, the church multinationals, their native accomplices. I mean, who the hell is going to support me? The natives don't want to because they're too scared for their life. The whites don't want to because they see me as a traitor. So I didn't feel I could proceed. But there was something, my mind was telling me that, but there was something inside me that was very stubborn and said, you have to, you have to keep going. In the years following the residential schools tribunal, Kevin Annett persisted in his efforts to document and make public the evidence of mass murder and ethnic cleansing in Canada. Abandoned, penniless, and attacked from all sides, Kevin nevertheless continued to speak out publicly on the hidden history of mass murder in Canada, and kept on documenting all that he had been told and had discovered about crimes against Native people. But Kevin's crowning achievement came in early 2001, when he finally published the accumulated testimonies and documents about atrocities in Canadian Indian residential schools in a book entitled Hidden from History, the Canadian Holocaust. A dozen separate publishers refused to produce the book, so Kevin printed it himself and circulated more than a thousand copies to libraries, governments, human rights groups and Aboriginal people around the world. But most of the books ended up in the hands of the people for whom Kevin had labored so long the residential school survivors themselves. In the fall of 2005, Kevin completed the much expanded second edition of Hidden from History, and for the first time asked the deeper question of why legal genocide had happened in his country. What had given rise to this plague in the first place, and why is it continuing? Kevin, you, you've remarked to me that the tides are changing, that things slowly, slowly are becoming made known. Yes, they are. It is very slow. Remember, it was ten years ago that that hearing took place. But I do believe that the changes that have come about 
are because of the price you have paid, a terrible price of what you have paid. I, I think uh, his work has been uh, serving a really valuable purpose by bringing, uh, first and foremost, these issues to light. And uh, I know Kevin's had to uh, endure uh, a lot of uh, suffering and uh, a lot of loss, um, and particularly in, in his work, his livelihood, um, his being defrocked and, and uh, losing his congregation and uh, uh, subsequent attacks uh, by um, the church, um, police po positions and powers of authority. And, uh, and a lot of the native people that uh, Kevin has worked with in the past as well have uh, suffered attacks, uh, people having their automobiles tampered with, uh, putting their lives in jeopardy, um, being um, attacked and under constant uh, surveillance uh, by hostile occupational forces uh, such as the RCMP. Let's fire Kevin at it if he doesn't have a job. He doesn't do the work he does in the community, and that's exactly what happened. And as anyone knows who was involved at that time, we tried desperately to convince the United Church not to uh, fire Kevin Anik because he was doing a lot of good work. But, of course, our pleas fell on deaf ears because those people didn't live in the community. They didn't witness the good work Kevin did. And the end result is their, their legacy of... Uh, corruption continues. Church officials have repeatedly silenced journalists and prevented publications from reporting the facts of both crimes in Indian residential schools and Kevin Annett's expulsion from the church. In January of 1999, the globally acclaimed magazine The New Internationalist ran a brief article on Kevin Annett and genocide in Canada. In response, National United Church official David Iverson circulated a 14-page character assassination of Kevin Annett to the world media and threatened the new internationalist with a boycott of their magazine unless it stopped all reporting of residential school crimes and Kevin Annett. New internationalist editors buckled to this pressure and never again reported Kevin Annett's work. In March of 1999, the national magazine Canadian Dimension was similarly silenced after it ran an article by Kevin Annett on the Ahousat land deal between the United Church and Macmillan Bloedel. United Church lawyers threatened Canadian Dimension with a multi-million dollar lawsuit unless it publicly retracted the article, which it did. In September of 1997, the Vancouver Courier newspaper ran a front page article on Kevin Annett that went into detail about Kevin's uncovering of land theft and other crimes by the church on Vancouver Island. United Church official Phil Spencer, who had helped arrange Kevin's dismissal from the church, tried to force a retraction by the newspaper and have the article's author, Clodo O'Connell, fired. When this failed, Spencer went so far as to verbally harass Ms. O'Connell at her home. I felt I had to call what I thought was the church back to its real soul, which had been lost. And you felt you could? Not by myself, but I felt I had to do that. I, I had to try. Did it work? It sure it worked. Why do you think all the shit has happened? It's because it worked. <laughs> <laughs> After you know, losing my wife and kids and um, uh, trying to re-educate, trying to get a PhD and then having that blocked, uh, being unable to support myself, having to save my dimes and nickels every week to have enough money to go on the bus to see my kids for two hours, you know, having to eat off plates in the university, uh, people, other people's food so I wouldn't have to buy dinner so I'd have enough bus fare to see my kids, that made me feel like I was on the bottom and that it was no one around to help me. Not even family, they just stood right back and said, well, this man should pull himself up by his own bootstraps. They didn't realize that there were all these forces in the world that were trying to keep me down that way, that the United Church did not want that PhD produced, that the, the RCMP did not want that tribunal done. And they, they but tried the more to they stop tried, that. what did that do to you, the more they tried? I got angry at them. I said, why? <clears throat> What the hell right do they have to do that to me? What the hell have I done wrong? Nothing. I you, said, did you I, lose your faith? In no, the, in here's, the, here's the wrong I did. The wrong I did was I expected the church to live by its principles. That was my wrong. What were its principles? It claimed to be following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. You know, to seek, you know, they have this great statement in the United Church to, uh, to walk humbly and uh, seek justice, you know in the world. Well, 
I just expected them to do that. That's what it said on paper. I just asked them to live by their principles when it had to do with land they had stolen from the native people and children that they had hurt and murdered in the residential school. I simply said, do what's right. And I was told time and again that it was wrong for me to have done that. You knew that it happened before. You were well read. Yeah. You realized that the last 200 years, 2,000 years that happened. Yeah, but I was complicit in it. I was part of the culture that did it. And I was blind to it. You know, raised in that condition of affluence, I was, uh, I had an idea. I remember thinking when I was in my 20s, oh yeah, native people. Yeah, they've been put down. I had kind of a vague idea that they were, they were on the outs and they had been attacked and murdered en masse and all that. But it didn't enter my life at all. I mean, it didn't really, the only contact I'd ever had with Native people was when I was 15. Uh, we went up to a village in northern BC on an exchange and we lived for 10 days among Aboriginal kids up there. And then they came down into our community and hung out with us. But what I saw just blew my mind in that little community of Hazleton in northern BC. Just unbelievable. I didn't think people lived like that in Canada. You know? They're worse than you did. Well, I mean, yeah, even the poorest white person, they, they, didn't, they didn't come anywhere near the experience of what was going on in that village. Kids running around, I mean, not just uh, literally without clothes and, and, and dying from malnutrition, but I mean, you know, there'd be like, uh, there was a little six-year-old girl whose dad had gone after with an axe. You know, she was carrying a, a mark around on her head because her dad had whacked at her while she was drunk. And uh, that was just accepted. Like, I mean, oh yeah, well... It wasn't considered um, there was anything wrong with that. And I thought, well, um, these people, I think I was scared by that. I thought, you know, and, and so when I got older, I thought, well, Native people are uh, uh, kind of an oddity. I don't really want to understand them too much. I mean, that was all going on to me. But then I realized I had to. The more I began to work with them, I had to understand. And what Why? did you come to understand? Well, it didn't come right away. It came over time. What came? What genocide really looks like, up close. What it means to be at the receiving end of a campaign to exterminate you. What it means to be the survivors of, a, of mass murder. You go around with, you feel like you're going to die at any moment. You're going to be tortured at any moment again. So all you have to do is hide. You've got to hide. You could identify with that? Oh, yeah. I still have nightmares about snakes and all the kind of things that happened to me in school and very difficult, you know. And sometimes I, I tried ending my life many times because I just couldn't stand the, the pain that I was going through. Took each of us in there one by one, and he had had us bend over and had Vaseline with with him. He did that to each of us three times. I remember that to satisfy himself. to enjoy himself on little kids. I forgot how old I was, either six, seven, or eight, maybe nine, I forget. But I remember, I'll never forget, Mr. Moore. He said, you know what, sis? He says, I can't wait to get out of this hell hole. I'm going to tell everything. And then the phone went dead. Uh, people at resident at Cooper Island always listened to our phone calls and censored our letters back, you know, coming in and going out. So I, you know, like I was afraid for him, but I didn't think it was going to be as bad as it was. It turned out as bad as it was. Two days later, we got a phone call saying that he hung himself, he committed suicide, but I never ever, ever um, believed in my heart that he'd ever do that. They had them walk through the gym while Richard was still hanging, 
and told them that it could happen to them. My brother died because of a cattle prod, of a shock of the cattle prod. When he was five, when he was four years old, they dragged him by the hair and they cut it. They cut his skin right off his head. The pastors did that with a whip, like a horse whip. It was sharp, with these little blades on it. And when I was in there, I heard him scream for help. And right away, there was a lot of blood on the floor. And they wouldn't, they wouldn't take him to a hospital or the nurse or nothing. They went. What happened then? What What happened when 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 I was in there? I heard him sc still scream for help. Rick, help! They tortured me. I'm gonna die. So he died right away, like like that. He was my only. He was my only. Uh, he was my only best friend and my only brother that I always loved. What would be the uh, final solution for you? What would uh, relieve your mind or give you calm? Well, you know, when you're dealing with a crime this huge, there isn't any solution ultimately because it's not as if something like this can be healed. It's like when you look at uh, genocide being perpetrated on one group of people, it never stays confined to that one group. It always blows back on the people per perpetrating it. And I often think about that when I look at you know what we're doing to the land and, and the environment. I mean, we we destroyed people who had been living in harmony uh, with the land for thousands, tens of thousands of years, and that can't help but affect us and, and the way that we live. But I think that um, something this huge, you can't just give a, an apology and a bit of money. It's an insult to people who have been sterilized and seen their friends murdered to think that that's going to solve anything. But what will begin to turn turn the tables on this? is if the perpetrators are brought to justice and are able to say, yes, we did these crimes, yes, we did try to wipe you out. To, I often know working with Native people who've been through these, these death camps um, called residential schools, for them, they never talk about money, they never talk about compensation. You know, a lot of the Native politicians will talk about that. But the people on the ground, they keep saying over and over, I just want to face the people who did this to me. I want to tell them what I think about them, and I want them to admit what they did to me in front of the world. Yeah. I think if they did that, I would forgive them if they would just admit what they did to us is genocide. And the government has never ever came up and uh, acknowledged their mistake of the residential school. And to me that's totally wrong. And the churches are hiding behind the laws of man-made laws and uh, not, not admitting their wrongs regarding residential school. And I, I feel less cowardly. They're thinking they figured they could get away with it? Oh yeah, of course Why they, could, they get could get away with it. Because they were the law. The church and the government were and still are the law. Uh, churches are exempt from, from prosecution for these things, clearly. For almost 10 years, the knowledge of these things have been out in the press. The courts have refused to prosecute the churches over these crimes. Time and again, judges have said, uh, this is this issue of genocide is not going to be addressed in this court. They restricted it to issues like, well, the children suffered a loss in education, or um, you know they were they were hit sometimes, but they they refused systematically to uh, to address the issue of murder and genocide. We know that in just the residential schools, the official death rate given by the government themselves was fifty percent. And if they took about, they claim a hundred thousand children went through the schools, but that's conservative. Uh, because they would often grab children in the whole areas, not just the seven-year-olds and up, which they had to do under the law, but three, four, five-year-old kids were common uh, in the residential schools. So if you double their number, you're probably talking a quarter of a million children went through the residential schools. Half of them who died, 100,000 children alone just in the residential schools. When you look at the whole history of the Indian Reserves, and it's got to be in the millions. They want evidence. As a seven-year-old child, I witnessed myself the burial of a child, and um, I didn't know what was happening at that time. I was with another person, another student, and he and I asked him. I said, "What's happening here?" I see them digging a hole in the um, in the, the orchard, and they said they're, they're burying another one. In '65, there's a bunch of us kids playing soccer in the backfield. There was a brush of uh, leaves and grass piled up and there was a body underneath it. Uh, one of the kids kicked the ball and he went to get it. It was quite decomposed. Went, went to Waterbury in 1960 and I was, um, 
I found a dead body in uh, 1967 uh, in between Ross Hall and Kawa Hall. Native girl, she's about 16. And uh, I, I told Jay Andrews, and Jay Andrews uh, shipped me out of uh, Puerto Rico, went to Nanaimo, and I believe it was a cover up. And we need those children returned home. They need to be brought back and given a proper burial. And that's really kind of a a most basic first thing that the churches and government need to do. They, they need to identify where those bodies are. And I remember we used to go with the graves there, and they would be kids that came from Charles Cancel Indian Hospital. How they died, I don't know. But I know we just dug a lot of graves. There, there was a lot of Eskimo babies buried in that burial ground, which was behind the principal's house. Uh, just on the other side of the staff garden. <clears throat> there was four of us that dug the grave. Um, myself, my brother Larry, Mel Patsy, and Albert Cardinal. When my mom was younger, she, her and a friend were instructed to go throw away this this thing that was wrapped in a newspaper, and they were told not to look into it, but they didn't listen, they unwrapped it, and it was a fetus. The one particular incident was uh, where a nun sexually abused, uh, well, uh, sexually abused a, a young boy, and, and as a result, the nun became pregnant and, and gave birth to a baby, and uh, after it gave birth to the baby, this was one incident that um, they they killed the baby and they had uh, they had the young fella dig a grave for the baby. Another incident was a a lady watched the witnessed a nun in Cranbrook uh, where they gave the baby and uh, had her participate in drowning the baby in the bucket of water. You know. And now it's become a cornerstone of some billing in Cranbrook. I would say that the main, a lot, one of the biggest things that we're asking for right now is just that where where are those children buried, and and how can we get them home? Uh, I mean, what is there any difference between what happened with uh, Nazi Germany and, and what's happened over here? The key now is to get a lot of the stories and the documentation out into the into the mainstream through these kinds of documentaries and uh, and just. Um, keeping the international pressure in Canada. I think, for example, you know, organizing uh, an international boycott of Canadian goods, maybe a boycott of the 2010 Olympics, something like that. That's the kind of thing that's going to bring international pressure in, on Canada. And I think that's the only way this stuff is ever going to come out because the, the, the contradiction here is that the very institutions that committed these crimes are still in power. You know, they're all legitimate, they're protected by the law, the government, the churches, the RCMP. You know, these are mainstream institutions, and they're not going to prosecute themselves over this. They're going to have to be brought to some kind of international court of justice. Is there one human that could be responsible for that, could be taken to court? Yeah, any of the, uh, you know, the fiduciary officers of these organizations, the Prime Minister of Canada, the heads of the United Church, the Catholic Church, the Anglican Church, the superintendent of the RCMP, they're all just as culpable under the Nuremberg Laws. Uh, you know, those precedents that say heads of state are just as liable for the actions of murder as are the soldiers who pull the trigger. Well, it isn't just the people in the residential schools that are liable for this, but, you know, these officials in the churches and government, which is probably why they've, they've put so much energy into denying this stuff, um, uh, smearing and, and uh, assassinating the character of people like me who are trying to bring out the, the truth about this, and intimidating Native eyewitnesses using their own chiefs often to do that. Who's going to listen, you know, who's going to stand up, you know, in a court case in this country of ours, you know, minimum we need is 80,000 bucks to 800,000 bucks to start a court case. And how many lawyers in this country of ours that's going to stand up and fight for our just rights? There ain't any. How many uh, Indian lawyers we got have yet seen one to step up to the plate to take the fight all the way? Oh. 
I hate doing this. You hear a lot about money, you don't hear about the actual deaths of children. And this is the issue we want to bring out now that's being systematically buried by the government and churches of Canada. It's being buried by the court process, which is accompanied by a gag order. If you're a native person and you go through the courts, one of the things that is imposed on you is a gag order so that you can't actually talk about the terms of your settlement or your story. And yet being able to tell one's story is essential to one's healing. And to being able to turn the tables, if you like, with shame. It isn't Aboriginal people who should be carrying the shame anymore. It's we, the culture that did it, who have to start carrying that cross. Right on, right on. So one of the ways we can do that is simply by telling the truth and forcing the truth out of institutions like this one. They have to come up from behind their lawyers and their money and their power. It's hard to uh, not hear the voices, not hear the cries, not hear... Like they're haunting and I pray that those little spirits that were captured near like that in pain that they'd be released. I opened that window on purpose. To be released out of here, you know. We've lost thousands upon thousands of children through suicide, not natural death, suicide. We find them every day of the week. We find them down in the city of Vancouver. You know, if the city of Vancouver is just a small part of what goes on across Canada and the United States, because we have a lot of our First Nations people dying on the streets of Seattle, because before the Europeans landed, our people traveled back and forth, and so they had relatives down there. And so we had, uh, like in Vancouver, for instance, you have between 45 to 60,000 Native people living in the city of Vancouver. And you're probably finding pretty close to 90% of them are dying on the streets, you know, of drug abuse, not alcohol, drug abuse. How do I know that? Because I sit on the, on the board down there with the Native Liaison Society that's attached to the Vancouver City Police. And I asked a question one time, how many of our people die, or people die on the streets of Vancouver? I said, whatever you read on the paper, you can multiply that by 10 times. And uh, just last, I think the year before last, you had 300... 65 deaths, so you could figure that out. And that's a direct impact of residential school. A friend of ours, Sylvia Yellowhorse from Alberta, she died because, because of alcohol poisoning. She drank so much. So I believe that she was one of the kids that was abused by one of the staff members or a few of the staff members. Oh, this, this really hurts. <laughs> Many of our women, uh, young women especially, are going missing. Uh, because now, after the residential school abuse and everything is over, uh, they're treating our young women like they're disposable. Um, nobody seems to care when they do go missing. As far as they're concerned, it's just another dead Indian. Right now, uh, in the downtown east side, Aboriginal people are the ones that are getting HIV. They're the ones that are getting hepatitis C. We're suffering the most from this, and we just got to stop it somehow. It's the only way we can stop it is by trying to get people to care, right? If you had to do it all over again, Kevin, would you do it again? Yes, absolutely, because I wouldn't have been able to live with myself if I had have known these things and done what I was told, which was to keep quiet about it. Because, you know, you're an accessory to a crime under the law if you do that, for one thing. Why don't Canadians have courage, Kevin? Why don't Canadians speak out? Why don't they ask questions? I don't know. Why are things thrown at us that we just accept? The, the native people on the coast even have a name for whites, the mamakni, the ghost people, the ones without substance, you know. I didn't want to be a mamakni anymore, I wanted to be a human being. What did you think of us as this, the natives? What did they see in us that we didn't see? They saw what we had lost. I think of what we lost, you know. Think of what happened in Europe. You know what happened in Europe over centuries? Same kind of trauma they want in here. The religious wars, the, the famines, the black death, the persecutions, the torture, 
the witch hunts, the mass murder of millions of people, throwing my ancestors off their land, all of the shit that happened here happened there. And so we're all trauma victims, you know, the, those of us who come over here, we haven't faced, we not only haven't faced our trauma when we came here, but we had lost something. Look what you've done to, to the First Nation people. You have killed their kids. You have abused their mind. You have abused their bodies. <clears throat> Physically and spiritually, you have abused us. Not only the land, you have raped the land. You have polluted the land. You have polluted the minds of, of the native people, the kids. You've raped the kids. You killed the kids. You look at indigenous people and say, well, why would we despoil our river? Why would we grab more land than we need? Why would there be poor people in our midst and rich people? That doesn't make any sense. I mean, no, no society can survive living like that, and yet it's the virtue in our society to operate like that. So we're crazy. I mean, we have become completely insane. And it comes out of that, you know, that, that terrible alliance that happened when you had this notion that a religion called Christendom was superior to all others and had to conquer the world, combined with the vested interest of a, a merchant class that wanted to conquer the world for its own profit, armed with this religion. Krishnamurti, who was a Hindu writer, he said a beautiful thing, and that's why I think, I don't believe in religions, uh, I believe the spirit is shared by people all over. Um, but he said, uh, God hides himself in the most broken ones among us, and God hides himself in the most broken parts of ourselves, hidden in there, but present, like a little seed. And I'd say that our worst experiences are a way to reveal that, and for us to find a new meaning and strength in our life. Because when you lose everything for the right reason, for a just cause, or for people who can't fight for themselves, when you stand with them and lose everything, you gain everything. You lose the false things in your life that we're so wedded to. The only thing the church did for me, did to me, was say I'm sorry, wrote a letter of apology. Some a bitch thinks, thinks writing on paper and saying verbally to me, saying I'm sorry, doesn't work. It, makes me more angrier to think they can give me a few dollars and, and uh, that'll make me forget. No, we're not all one happy family. There's this whole world, like every society for 5,000 years, has rests on the suffering and misery and exploitation of some group of people. And you're not going to find God up in a church somewhere. You're going to find God down there in the garbage heap with those people. That, to me, is a message of Christ. So why don't we you know, get that, Kevin? Because Christianity was hijacked by wealthy institutions and the rich, and it's been their servant for centuries, when it really belongs in the hands of the poor. Now on, all generations will declare God has brought down the mighty from the throne and has lifted up the poor. God sent away the wealthy and has filled the hungry with good things. It's like what you get in, in the, the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor and woe to the rich. He says that. And it's kind of like this big reversal. Suddenly all the things that the powerful, the government, the corporations, the churches, they all think everything's on our side. We've got the world wrapped up. We can go carpet bomb Iraq whenever we want. You know, we can destroy anybody we want. Suddenly it's all reversed. And those things are their downfall. And the ones who they're bombing, suddenly you realize like Martin Luther King learned and Gandhi learned, those are the ones with the power to change history, not the assholes who think they're in charge. That's a revolutionary message, and that's what I tried to speak about from the pulpit in Port Alberni, and also to create. I tried to create it. I tried to put it into practice. And you saw what happened. I mean, it's not surprising what happened to me. And I'm taking strength from that now because I realize it's what happens when you try to live the message. You will get nailed, but that's their undoing. It's not my undoing. I'm not undone. They're undoing themselves. That's the victory.
From now on, all generations will declare me blessed for the mighty one has done the most magnificent things to me. Stood up and walked with the lowest of the low, honoring them. Before all of us, I am now diabetic from now on dialysis. I am losing my sight. My legs are giving out on me, and now I've got to realize too that I ain't got much time. I know that, but I want to give my love to my sons for what days I got left because they, they got to know that I do love them, even though I couldn't tell them for years, but I do. I care about them lots. I didn't want to share my, my, my past with them, but I finally told them. They cried with me. Fed the hungry with good things, put the wealth beyond empty and sent them away. Hey, 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 hey. And then reawoke in human hearts compassion. For all who've breathed this air before, and for all who suckle at this planet now, and for all to come forevermore. For all to come forevermore.